Are there any questions? Any questions? No questions. First, I make a brief review of a slide in number 16, and then I'm going uh, to briefly go through different parts of question number one. The solutions are already aligned. However, I briefly go through them. If you have any questions, you can ask. So first, a brief summary of a slide number 16 from chapter five. If you've got a beam which is subject to pure bending, the cross-section of the beam experiences a normal stresses. And the normal stress has a linear variation in terms of a Y. Y is the distance of any layer, any fiber from the neutral axis. If the beam is subject to a lateral shear force, not only the cross-section is subject to normal stresses, any plane which is along the axis of cylinder is subject to shear stresses. The shear stresses because of a lateral shear force is called a flexural shear. So when in chapter one we're dealing with shear stresses, we call them a pure shear, a simple shear. This is also shear stresses, but these shear stresses are called flexural shear stresses. So normal stress acting on the cross-section and shear stresses on planes which are along the axis of the beam or in the longitudinal direction. So this is the equation for finding normal stresses and this is the equation for finding the shear stresses. So the shear stress is equal to the shear force applied at each section multiplied by the first moment of area I divided by the second moment of area I multiplied by the width of the beam. So I is the first moment of area of the section of the area which is close, enclosed uh, between the layer we are interested to find is a shear flow and the free surface or upper layer of the beam. So the first moment, if I'm interested to find the shear stress in this plane, in the longitudinal direction, I need to find the first moment of area of this gray region with respect to the neutral axis. So obviously, the higher the value of I is, the higher the shear stress is and vice versa. You can see that the, this section, this part of this section has highest first moment of area with respect to the neutral axis. Therefore, the shear stress, maximum shear stress, occurs on the neutral plane or neutral axis of the beam. The maximum normal stress occurs when Y is maximum. It means that the maximum normal stresses occur on the top and bottom layers of the beam. I repeat, the maximum shear stress or max, maximum flexural shear stress occurs on the neutral plane. So this is just a brief review of what we had on Monday. So if we've got a beam with a rectangular cross-section. Wrong one, sorry. That's all right. Normal, the maximum normal stress is okay on the bottom and top layers. The maximum shear stress occurs on the neutral plane. So in order to optimize this way, it is better to remove uh, the material which is not uh, carrying much load and make the section a slightly taller. So we end up with an I section beam and all the beams at the moment holding us in place are all have all I sections. So these are the text look, which I explained on uh, Monday. Now this example I solved uh, different requirements of question 1D. Question 1 is related uh, to a beam with a length of two meters and made of aluminium with a shear modulus of 70 gigapascals. It has a different boundary conditions, so two of them are cantilever beams, two of them are simply supported beams, and they are subject to either a lateral shear force or a uniformly distributed load. 
So I solve question 1D, different requirements of question 1D. So I briefly go through the remaining ones. And if you have any questions, you can ask. As I said, the solutions are already online. So the three requirements for each part of question one is finding the maximum normal stress applied to the cross-section, the maximum shear stress applied, and also the maximum deflection for each case. So question one C is a cantilever beam subject to a uniformly distributed load, and the intensity of the force is a W. If I uh, remove uh, the support, we've got a shear force of WL acting upward and a negative bending moment of a WL squared over 2. So the resultant force of WL acting at its middle, so it's WL multiplied by L over 2 gives us the moment. I showed you the other, I mean, last week or the week before how to draw the shear force and bending moment diagrams and how to write the general equations for the distributed load, shear force, and the bending moment. As you can see, all of them are function of functions of Z, which Z is along the axis, and its origin is at the left end. So in order to find the maximum normal stress acting, so the problem is asking us to find the maximum normal stress and its location, the maximum shear stress and its location, and the maximum deflection and its location. And the cross-section is rectangular. So look at the equation for the normal stress. In order for the normal stress to be maximum, is like the bending moment to be maximum, and also the y coordinate to be maximum. I, the second moment of area, is a constant value. Now, if you look at the bending moment distribution, you can see the maximum bending moment occurs at the left end, at the built-in support. So, N max is equal to WL squared over 2. So, definitely the maximum which normal stress occurs at the support, and Y max are the two layers at the very top, at the at the very bottom of the beam. So, Y max is plus minus 60 millimeters. So this is M max, which is 10 kilonewton meters. If I substitute the values of W and so if I substitute the value of W and L in the equation, I end up with the value of 10 kilonewton meters. We have the maximum normal stresses at the top and bottom layers, so plus minus 60 millimeters. If I substitute the values, I get the maximum normal stress of plus minus 69.44 megapascals. So as you can see, at this location, it's a negative bending moment. It means at the top a layer is subject to tensile stress of 69, and the bottom layer of the beam at the clamp support is subject to a normal stress of minus 69.4. So if I was asked to, in exam, I can explain it. I can say where the location of the maximum normal stress or, or I can say at z equal to zero and y plus minus 60 millimeters, we have the maximum normal stresses. So that is the answer. You can explain it, but if you just write it at z equal to zero and y is equal to plus minus 60, does the answer gives the answer to the question. But the next requirement is to find the maximum shear stress. The shear stress does not depend on the bending moment. It depends on the shear force applied at each section. Now, if you look at the bending, uh, shear force distribution, again, the shear force for this case is maximum at the clamp support and is equal to W times L. So if I substitute it in the top equation here, V max must be equal to 10 kilonewtons. I, which uh, I already half second moment of area width is equal to 60 millimeters now i should find uh, the layer which has the maximum i value with respect to the neutral axis so obviously if i look at the cross section this is the neutral axis this region which is above the neutral axis makes the maximum i value with respect to the neutral axis. So you can see here, this is the shear force. This is 
The first moment of area of this region, the area is equal to 60 by 60, and this is equal to y bar, which is a 30. It gives us 2.8 megapascals. The problem is also asking us to find the shear stress at a location 30 millimeters above the neutral axis. So it's very similar, except we have, we have to find the I value for this region because we are after the shear stress in this layer. And as I explained on Monday, if you've got a solid section or a thick walled section, if it's subject to a lateral shear force, the normal stress or normal stresses in comparison with shear stresses are quite large. So therefore in their design, we usually ignore the shear stresses. We mostly focus on normal stresses. But when the section becomes a thin, the difference is not, I mean, usually shear stresses become relatively high. So that is the main factor for designing a thin wall sections, which are subject to lateral shear forces. Again, if I was asked in the exam to find, to answer, where the position of the maximum shear stress is, I should say, at, in this case, at z equal to zero and at y equal to zero. At z equal to zero means it's at the clamp support, and at y equal to zero, it means on the neutral axis. So any question in regard to question 1c? The solutions are already online. Yes, please. So both max stresses, so both max stress and max so both max shear force and max shear stress are at the clamp support in a one part on caster support. For this case, yes. Yes. For this case, both a normal stress and, and a shear stress are both located at the built-in support. The maximum normal stresses are at the top and bottom layers of the beam and the maximum shear stress is located on the neutral plane or neutral axis. So shear is center plane. If you just raise your hand when you're asking question, this is not a one face-to-face -face question. Uh, uh, yes, please. So shear is equal to, so shear is at the center plane, and uh, normal is at the extremities. That's right, that is what I said. Okay, so we move on to the next uh, part of the question. The other requirement, so I did in this first slide, I did normal stresses and shear stresses. So actually maximum normal stress and maximum shear stress. Now the next requirement for this part of the question is finding the deflection distribution and also the maximum deflection. So these are the general equations and this is the equation I showed you on Monday, the relation between the bending moment, which is a function of z, second moment of air deflection with respect to z, and bending rigidity or bending stiffness, which is the product of the Young's modulus and the second moment of area of the section. This equation is valid if the section has at least one axis of symmetry. Also, obviously, it's valid if it has two axes of symmetry. So at least one axis of symmetry. For asymmetric bending, you cannot use this equation. The equation is different. So this is M, which we had it. I showed you two weeks ago how to find, uh, to, to write the bending moment distribution. Now we've got the second derivative of deflection with respect to Z, which is equal to this value here. And the first integration gives us the slow. It's a finance function. So when I integrated, I had to add a constant value. The second integration gives us a deflection distribution along the beam. So we can find a C1 and C2 based on the boundary conditions. In this case, this is a clamp support. We've got zero deflection at this clamp support at Z equal to zero. We also have zero slope at the clamp support. So therefore, both of them end up to be equal to zero. And if I substitute the values, obviously both of them are zero. We end up with a deflection distribution and a slope distribution. For a simple, it's a determinate beam. It's a simple, it's a um, cantilever beam. Uh, therefore, 
The maximum deflection must occur at the free end. So at z equal to l gives us the maximum deflection, also the maximum slope. So if an examiner was asked to give uh, the answer to where the position of the maximum deflection is, I would say at z equal to l. You don't need any explanation. At z equal to l is the maximum deflection. So maximum normal stresses at z equal to zero, y equal to plus minus 60 millimeters, that's the answer where the location is or where the locations are, whatever. And for the maximum shear stress, at z equal to zero and at y equal to zero, which is neutral axis, for the deflection at z equal to L is the maximum deflection. Now, a common mistake among you in exam or for the course that you're doing at the moment is that you, some students write a constant value here. As you can see, bending moment is not a constant value, it's a function of z. Any question in relation to this example? So for the other two, I just briefly go through them. So the next one, we've got a simply supported beam. The requirements are similar, maximum normal stress and maximum shear stress. We have a simply supported beam subject to distributed load, so obviously the maximum bending moment occurs in the middle at z equal to L over 2. So where the position of the maximum normal stresses are exactly the same, y plus minus 60 millimeters. For the shear stress, you can see we have the maximum uh, shear forces at the two ends when is equal to WL over 2 or minus WL over 2. The rest, in terms of analysis, it's very similar. So once you find the position of the maximum bending moment and the shear force, you just substitute it in the equations similar to the previous one and you can solve it. Any question in relation to question 1b? No. And for deflection again, as you can see, the bending moment distribution here is quadratic. I showed you how to write these equations two weeks ago. Again, EI second derivative of deflection is not a constant value. I keep repeating it. A few students in the exam, they write it or in the course work at the moment, the last part of your assessment sheet you're doing, they put a constant value and integrated double. So usually they don't get any mark for it. So here NZ goes inside, double integrated. Now the constant values. For cantilever is relatively straightforward. For the simply supported one, as Z equal to zero, we have zero deflection. In this case, I can say as Z equal to L over two, we have zero slope. What I, I would suggest you use uh, the N support condition. So at z equal to zero and z equal to l, both the deflections are zero. Again, it's not wrong in this case because the system is symmetric. You say that the slope at z equal to l over two is zero. That is, gives you exactly the same answer. But I would suggest you just use always the support conditions. So you find C1 and C2, substitute in the top equations. Now, in this case, the maximum deflection, obviously, is a simply supported. The maximum deflection occurs in the middle. So if you draw the deformed uh, geometry of the beam, this is the exaggerated deformed uh, geometry. The maximum deflection occurs in the middle here. So this is the maximum deflection. So at z equal to L over 2, and we have maximum a slope at these two ends, not at the middle. At the middle, the slope is not maximum, it's, it's zero. <coughs> Any question or questions in regard to question 1b? So 
this is a simply supported bone with a lateral shear force at the middle. Use a safe function for the shear force, similar to what you have to do for the last question of your um, assessment sheets. When the engine is on, you need to use stiff functions. And the bending moment distribution, shear force distribution, the requirements similar. So the maximum bending moment occurs in the middle, FL over 4. The maximum shear force occurs at two ends, which is equal to F over 2. Again, once I've got them, the rest is similar to the previous example I showed you the solution. And the deflection, again, we just double integrated to find the deflection. The first integration gives us the slope. I repeat, if you're using a stiff function, do not touch the turns inside the angle brackets, it loses its characteristic or characteristics. So the first integration gives us the slope, the next one gives us um, the, the first the slope, the next one gives us the deflection. Any questions? Now, on one day, I didn't have time to finish the shear loading section, so I can't solve the remaining examples of this chapter for you. I have put together some slides for you, help you to do your assessment sheets, and I've just dragged some of the examples from uh, chapter 6. You don't need the, because it's combined loading, it's based on the course content of chapters 1 to 5. So the next few slides are based on combined loading and your um, assessment sheets are based on combined loading. First you apply, first you applied bending, then you applied a torsion and when the, the load was applied on the side, it was a combination of bending and torsion. So I put together these uh, slides for you. So as I said, I've dragged some of the, uh, picked some of the examples from um, chapter six. So this is a tube, similar to the one you did experimental on. X, a Y coordinate system is attached to the cross section and Z is along the axis. So if we apply a force on the side, so this is a slide, I've uh, picked up this uh, figure from a slide number 18 of chapter 5. So I'm looking at the cross section of this tube. Now in the lab, you did not apply the force exactly on the left side of the tube or on the right side of the tube. A rod of negligible weight was attached to the end of the tube and you applied the load at the end of the rod. Here I've applied the force exactly on the side of the tube. Now do you agree, if material has a linear elastic behavior, the solution of this problem is a combination of the solution of a problem when the force is applied exactly at the center of the tube and when we are applying a torque with the value of F multiplied by R. So if I apply the force exactly at the center, the only effect it has is bending. But if the force is applied away from the center of the beam, obviously, it's subject to a combination of the bending and torsion. And the value of the torque is equal to F multiplied by R. So if I want to analyze this problem, first I go to chapter four and solve this problem, find the stresses because of the torque, then move on to chapter five when the beam is subject to a lateral shear force at its tip. Now this is an additional figure. Say we've got this tube, we have a force of a three little f applied on the left hand side and we've got a little f applied on the right hand side. Now if I'm going to analyze it similar to what I'm doing on the top, what is the value of the force applied when I'm analyzing it subject to 
bending. I am going to ask you, could you raise your hand if you think the answer is a 2F? Please you raise your hand. If it, I'm going to analyze it subject to bending, if the answer is a 4 little f. Excellent. So the answer, if I'm going to analyze it, just subject to bending, the answer, the force applied at the center, which you learn about shear center on Monday, if I apply that the shear center or the center of this tube is equal to 4F. Now, what is the value of the torque? I'm going to ask you, is the value of the torque equal to 4F times R, 2, don't shake your hand, <laughs> is it equal to 2F times R, is it 4F times R? I am asking again. The torque applied to this uh, tube, is it a 2F multiplied by R? Raise your hand. Okay. Or is it 4F times R? Excellent. So if I'm going to analyze uh, this bar, it is a tube, it's subject to a force of 4F, which the effect is bending. And the torque is equal to 2F times R. Now, one of these students just sent me an email uh, is that in your um, equation, in the assessment sheet, the equations I uploaded for you, what's the difference between little f and capital F? Now, in the first part, if you remember, when you were analyzed, we were experimenting on the tube, and you had, you had two forces applied on the two sides. So I called each one little f. So, the resultant would be 2F acting in exactly at the center. So I call the resultant force as capital F. So the, in your equations, the equations I've given you, capital F is the resultant force. A little f is each force applied on the sides. So for the combined bending and torsion, for the last part, you only apply the force on one side. So therefore, F was equal, the capital F was equal to little f. Any questions in relation to this slide? Or your assessment sheets at the moment, any question in relation to that, uh, to, to assessment sheets? Any technical question? No questions. Are you done? The yes, assessment sheet is the lab uh, analysis. Yes. Yes, 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 absolutely. And the deadline is the 30th of November. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have a picked up this example, which is one of the, I mean, you have seven examples uh, in chapter six, which I've already uploaded for you, the course content, the examples and lecture slides. And this is one of the cases of question number seven of chapter six which more or less similar to the tube you did experiment on. So here we've got a thin walled a tube, which is subject to a lateral shear force of F and a torque of T. The problem is asking us to find uh, the stresses applied at these uh, three locations, on these, in these uh, three elements. Now, if you remember, your strain gauges were located, the strain rosettes were about 20 centimeters away from the clamp support. Because we usually do not attach the strain gauges where the clamps are, where the, bound, where the support conditions are. It doesn't give you a good answer. In numerical analysis, finite element analysis is very similar. You do not um, measure values or extract values where you are applying boundary conditions. So in this case, we put it exactly next to the support. In your case, we're 20 centimeters away from the support. So the problem is asking us to find the stresses, the stress components for these uh, three elements. So you can see I have attached XY coordinates to each of these elements. Now I start with the torque applied. Do you agree? Base if I remove uh, the force, I'm using superposition rule. I'm finding the stresses when I apply each load individually, then I superimpose them, superimpose the values. First, I apply just the torque. I ignore that lateral shear force. So I move on to chapter four. We've got a tube, separate tube, 
which is subject to a talk. So do you agree that the shear stresses for all the three elements will be the same? All of them are subject to a torque multiplied by R divided by J, where R is the mean radius of the tube. Now ignore this X5 I've written here for you. I explain it on in two weeks' time when we move on to chapter six. So the shear stress, all these three elements experience the same shear stresses, or the same shear stress. Now we move on to the effect of this force here. So I'm going to remove the torque. I apply just the tip force. Now, point which of these uh, three are located on the neutral uh, plane of the tube when it's subject to a force? If you think point one is located on the neutral plane, raise your hand. If you think a point two is located on the neutral plane, raise your hand. Very good. So what is the neutral plane of this beam when it is subject to a force of F? The neutral plane is, I don't call it little x because this is little x. So the neutral plane, say this is capital X and this is Z, I call it XZ plane is the neutral plane. You agree with me? So point two is located on the neutral plane. Do you agree that because of a force F, point two is located on the neutral plane, that its Y coordinate is equal to zero, so it has, it's subject to no normal stress. Now point one, is it located on the compression side or tension side? If I apply the force. How many of you think it's located Point one on the compression side if we apply bending. How many of you think one is located on the tension side? Excellent. So if I apply bending here, the top layer will be subject to tension and the bottom layer will be subject to compression. So point one is located, which is this point here, is located on the tension side or tensile side, point three on the compression side. So sigma is equal to my over i, i is the second moment of area of the cross-section, and y is just the radius of the cylinder, similar to the example 2 I've solved for you the other day. Point 2 is 0, and point 3 is compression minus my over i. It has no internal pressure, there is no circumferential stress acting at any of the points, Therefore, for all three points, the force, the stress applied in the y direction is equal to zero. So I found the stress components for these uh, three points. Now, you remember from chapter one, at very, very end, I showed you that for a very thin and small element, we have at most, which is flat, we have at most uh, three stress components two normal and one shear. We go through it in more detail in chapter six. So each of these points is subject, at most could be subject to three stress components, two normal and one shear. We've got this shear, which is coming from this torque here, and we've got these two coming from the normal stresses. Now, you might say, what about the shear stress because of the lateral force, which is valid? At the moment, I'm ignoring the flexural shear stress. I think it's, I've written it at the, at the top of question seven. Otherwise, that should be included because point two is located on the neutral plane. So this helps you to do your um, assessment sheets of the equation at the moment you see uh, or the equations at the moment you're using and I've uploaded the, those equations for you already. Yes, please. So for the flexural stress, do you add it to sigma x? Uh, no, this is shear stress. Is, is oh, this yeah. Okay. Sorry. okay. That's a good point, but it's shear, not a normal shear. Okay, any other questions? Right. 
Now, I'm also going through the slide. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. This is a very good question. Um, in previous years, some students use a two pi r cube to your say for j. Some students use pi over 32, out of diameter to power of 4. The answers are very, very similar. Either way, that's fine with me, there's no problem. But if you can do it, it's exactly almost the same. How many of you at the moment are using a pi r cube t for? Second moment of area for your assessment sheet, laboratory assessment sheets. How many of you using a pi over 64 out of diameter for minus? You're not you doing any. Okay, which one are you using? The second one. The second one, the fourth power of out of diameter. Okay. Both of them give you the same answer. Any other question? Any other questions you have? Technical questions? Don't send me by email. I can explain it here rather than writing it. Any questions in relation to your assessment sheets, the equations I've up uploaded for you? Yes, please. Where can we access them? I uploaded for you. Are they already on Blackboard? Yes, so they're on Chapter 5. No, the equations for, because I did, when I, I, um, I believe uh, your assessment sheets, uh, laboratory assessment sheets were available on 4th of November. At the time, uh, you, I hadn't covered chapters 4, 5, and 6 for you, so I gave you the equations. You re I call them required equations. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. E excellent. So if uh, uh, you downloaded uh, your laboratory assessment sheets, I also uploaded a small PDF file called uh, required equations. So those equations are very similar to what you see at the moment here on this slide. Miss, by God, am I an idiot? It turns out they were there. Okay. So we move on to a slide one. Again, a slide one, it's a combined loading case. It's based on chapters of one to chapter five. I put it at the beginning of chapter six because whatever we do in chapter six are for a combined loading case. So I can briefly go through slide number one for you. And it saves me time for, f I can use the future hours for other materials which I haven't covered yet. So in a slide in number one, chapter six, as I said, course content have already been uploaded. We've got a thin wall cylinder, very similar to the one you did experiment on. So it's a thin wall cylinder with a thickness of T, cross-sectional area A, Second uh, moment of area, second of uh, Ix and Iy, and the polar second moment of area of J. Obviously, J is equal to Ix plus Iy. Here, I've attached alpha beta coordinate system to the cross section, and this is the cross section of the tube. Obviously, I, if it should have been based on uh, the standards of drawing, it should be on the right hand side. I put it for you on the left hand side. Now say we've attached the strain rosettes at these uh, three points, or we're after the stress and the strain components at these three locations. One at the very top of this cylinder, similar to the strain rosettes you had in the lab, yours were somewhere here. And one is located in, say, along the axis Z in the alpha Z plane, and one is located at the very bottom of the cylinder. So one at the very top, one at the very top, bottom, and one on the niche in the middle. Now this thin walled cylinder is subject to internal pressure, is subject to axial load, subject to bending, and subject to torsion. So based on superposition rule, we are interested to find the stress components at these uh, three locations. So these are the three locations. You can see them on this slide. As I said, based on what you learned in chapter one, each of these elements is 
if it's a very small flat area, at most it's subject to three stress values, two normal and one shear. Two normal and one shear. As you can see, shear stress is complementary. So we are going to, material has little elastic behavior. So we find the stresses when each of those loads are applied individually and then we superimpose them. Because in reality, for engineering structures, it's very rare we have only one type of loads applied, one type of load applied to a structure. We always have a combination of loads applied. So we can use superimposition rule if material has a linear elastic behavior. So we are after three stress components at each point. Now I'm going to start with the easiest case, when this tube subject to axial loading tension. So I'm moving on to chapter one. The cross-sectional area is A, and the force applied is F. Assuming the force is uniformly distributed, you agree all these three points are subject to the same stress of F over A or any other points on the cross-section, on the, on the outside the beam, is subject to the same stress value, which is F over A. Are we happy to that? Are, are we happy with that, F over A? So, in chapter one, if you had a beam subject to tension, F over A was the answer. So all these uh, three points are subject to the same tensile stress of F over A. Now, say F doesn't exist. Now I'm moving, moving on to chapter two. I apply internal pressure of P. So in chapter two, when we had a thin wall pressure vessel, a thin wall cylinder, the pressure applied a normal stress of PD over 40 in the axial direction, we called it sigma Z, and it also applied PD over 2T, which was a circumferential stress. So if we look at this element at the moment, here, sigma x is the same as sigma z. You agree with me? If I look at this element, sigma x and sigma z are the same. So the pressure inside applies a circumferential stress of PD over 2T in the y direction. So y is the same as circumferential direction for this tiny element. And PD over 40, which is actual stress, will be added to F over A. Is there any, are, are you happy with what I've written? Do you have any questions in regard to what I've shown you so far? So first I was in chapter one, moved on to chapter two. It's inter internal pressure. And then axial stress is in the same direction of x. Look at the x, y coordinates attached to each element. For all of them, x is the same direction as z. x, y is a local coordinate system. And z theta is for the whole cylinder. Now I'm moving on to chapter four. I'm just applying a torque to this cylinder. So the torque just applies a shear stress. It does not apply normal stresses. And we have a T over J for all the points that are located on the cylinder. Not just one, two, and three. Any other point is subject to the same shear stress. Are you happy with that one as well? Now I'm moving on to chapter five. I'm going to apply a bending moment. Is this a positive bending moment or is this a negative bending moment? Positive? If you think it's positive, raise your hand. Excellent, that's correct, that's very good. So it's positive. So the top layer is subject to compression and the bottom layer is subject to tension. Now, point one is on the compression side or tension side. Compression, raise your hand. The top side? The top side is compression. I said raise your hand, yeah? Yes. 
So the top one is compassion. Yeah, this is my yeah, that's my fault. Okay. Everyone, I'm sorry about this. And what is point two? Is it compassion or tension? Tension? If you think it's tension, point three. Is it on the tension side? Raise your hand. Point three. Tension? So ten point three is getting longer. Point one is getting compressed. Very good. Hand down. And what about point two? Point two is on the neutral axis. If you, it is correct. If I'm correct, please raise your hand, please. Point two, very good. So point one is on the compression side. Point three is on the tension side. And a point two is on the neutral plane. So can I say, because of bending moment M, I can add a negative sign here because all the other two, the two other stresses are tension, tensile. So I add a negative sign here and I add a positive sign here. Do I have to add anything here? No. So this is located on the neutral plane, so I have to add plus zero. And that's it. I found the stress components at these three points. And this is actually the solution to the last part of your ass assignment sheet or laboratory assignment sheet, a very short example at the very end, which I've asked you to do. It's, this is a solution for it. Yes, please. In, in the command stress, we've got the F over A. What area are you doing that over? That is a very good question. This is this area, this black area. So in this case, because this is a thin wall, we can say it's pi D times T. Or you can just use pi over 4, multiply outer diameter squared minus inner diameter squared. But the, both of them give you exactly the same answer, almost the same answer. So that was a very good question. The cross-sectional area is pi dt, which is this black area. Pi dt. And the second moment of area is obviously pi r cubed t, or the other equation, pi over 64 times fourth power of outer diameter minus fourth power of inner diameter. So any questions? When I saw chapter six, I don't think we can have time to start on Monday. I have got a lot to cover on Monday. Um, so I'll briefly go through it because I explained it here uh, in detail. Any questions? So we've got two minutes. Uh, it's t 12 minutes at uh, 2 6. I can finish. It's better to finish it now. So thank you very much and have a very nice weekend. Thank you very much to you as well, Ms. Thank you. Yeah, either one of them. Either 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 of
对，这两个。